Welcome to Modern Vaccine and Adjuvant Production and Characterization presented by Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Tamla Oliver, Managing Editor of GEN, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. The need for safe and effective vaccines is not news to anyone. What is news is that new analytical methodologies have made characterization of vaccines and adjuvants more efficient and effective than ever before. The various technologies available for use today have been instrumental in improving our understanding of vaccine properties and functions. Researchers are now able to characterize vaccines, even complex vaccines containing adjuvants, to a degree that was not previously possible. These days, even very minor structural changes that may have previously gone undetected can be identified with a high degree of accuracy. The two speakers today, Stephen Pincus and Chris Fox, have extensive experience characterizing vaccines and adjuvants. They've tried out many new technologies and ultimately adopted several that have streamlined their operations and helped them make vaccines safer and more effective. They will share their latest insights and enabling practices with us in just a minute. Before we get started, though, I want to encourage you to submit questions for our panelists. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. You can, you can submit a question at any time during the webinar by typing your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and hitting Submit. Stephen Pincus is our first speaker. He's worked in the field of recombinant vaccines and immunotherapeutics for over 25 years. At Novavax, he is the head of analytical and quality operations. His groups are responsible for product release, assay development, qualification, validation. Members of his team also contribute to immunological assay development and testing for preclinical and clinical studies. Stephen will discuss the challenges inherent in working with virus-like particle vaccines. Stephen, we're ready when you are. Thank you, Tamlin. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to talk to you today about the analytical characterization of vaccines. And uh, what I'll first start doing is, t is telling a little bit about the history of vaccines and how uh, we've been able to characterize them over the years and some of the challenges with newer vaccines that are uh, much more complicated uh, and, and which we, we really want to try to characterize in the same manner that we characterize all the biological products. So if we go to the second slide after my title slide, it's, this gives you a little history of, of vaccines. We've had three different types of major vaccines in, in, that have been used though, over the years. Live attenuated viruses of bacteria, examples there are MMR, uh, smallpox, and, and uh, bacterial BCG for tuberculosis, inactivated vaccines like for rabies and polio, and finally what we would call subunit or acellular vaccines, which are basically components of a vaccine but not highly purified. So they're, they're still very crude mixtures uh, of, of multiple vaccine components uh, from the organism, uh, but they're not the exact co-organism. And how do we characterize these? If we go to the next slide, what we find is that there are three major things that we're doing when we're trying to characterize a vaccine. We're trying to determine, one, the antigenic dose and potency. Uh, these can be expressed as infectious units, if it's a virus or, or a bacteria. It can be uh, expressed as the amount of protein determined by assays like SRID, single radial immunodiffusion, and I'll speak about that a little more in a few minutes, as well as potency in animal models, where we may vaccinate the animal with the uh, characteristic vaccine and look for either an immune response or protection against a lethal challenge with the pathogen of interest. The second major use of characterization is for stability. Uh, all vaccines are going to have a certain shelf life, and what we want to do is to determine that we can measure the infectious dose or the antigen concentration uh, and establish that shelf life so that we're sure the vaccine is going to be appropriate to be used during that period, uh, and, and also that it will maintain potency uh, during that shelf life. And finally, we have to be able to identify the vaccine. We have to make sure that we have got the right vaccine in the vial, so we have done that in the past by methods like Western blot, serum visualization, immunofluorescence, uh, and assays of, of, of a basically immuno uh, characterization technique. Now, in the past several years, we've really developed a new type of vaccines called virus-like particles. And that's, if we go to the next slide, you'll see some uh, description of that. There are uh, basically two types of virus-like particles that are licensed. They're both non-enveloped. They represent vaccines for hepatitis B produced by uh, Merck and GSK, and for human papillomavirus, again, also produced by Merck and, and GSK. They're made in, in various types of uh, cell lines, including insect cells, uh, 
And what, the, what these vaccines really consist of is a single viral protein that can spontaneously form into a particle that's indistinguishable from a natural virus particle. And that gives you certain advantages in terms of uh, immunogenicity and uh, producibility of the vaccine. But more recently, Movavax and other companies have been working on a type of virus-like particle that's even more complicated than what I just described, and, and that is an envelope virus-like particle. That is a particle... Um, that contains not only viral proteins, but an envelope that they're surrounded in. So it actually has a more complex and more difficult to categorize structure. If we go to the next slide, I'll show you an example of an EM of recombinant influenza virus by particles. These are spherical, pleomorphic structures. You can see HA and NA spikes that, that come out of these structures from the lipid bilayer, which is derived from the cell. And uh, within, inside of that bilayer is the matrix protein, which is required for forming these particles. Now, as, as I started to indicate previously, virus-like particles really offer us a new type of vaccine with very interesting properties. Number one, because they are a particle, they're taken up differently than more soluble types of vaccines and, and really presented very well to the immune system by antigen-presenting cells giving a, a broader immune response than we may get with other types of vaccines. And the repeated nature, these, these spikes, which are multiple copies of the same virus proteins, really give us a, a good uh, multiple presentation of the same antigen to the immune system. And because of that, again, we, we get a better immune response than if, if we had a more soluble type of uh, vaccine. There's also no differences in, in how we can characterize these vaccines. And if we go to the next slide, We'll talk about that a little bit. So, again, we want to really look at the necessary assays for releasing the vaccine and establishing stability. And, of course, now with a virus-like particle, we add some additional complexity to these assays. For example, in release, we still have to look at identity, potency, dose confirmation, purity. But now we also have to be able to monitor the secondary structure of the vaccine because it's a particle. We want to make sure that we maintain that particle structure during the shelf life of the vaccine and that that's not changing and, and possibly losing immunogenicity uh, during the uh, storage of the vaccine. The stability. We've got to confirm the dose, the potency. Are there any energy modifications that are occurring, okay? Is there any kind of oxidation or deamination? Any changes to the, to the membrane components of the vaccine that might affect the characteristics of the vaccine? And finally, again, the secondary structural characteristics. Uh, are, are there changes in the particle or, or the association of these proteins within the particle? And finally... The last uh, item that we want to look at with these new generation vaccines is comparability. As we're manufacturing the vaccine during stages of development, we want to be able to show that we're making a, a, the same vaccine uh, that we tested in phase one and phase two as we then move past in phase three and, and actually go on to license. And if we change our manufacturing process at all or the plant that's actually manufacturing the vaccine, we want to be able to show that we haven't changed the product at all, that it's the same vaccine that we've been making all along. So now in the next few slides, what I'm going to do is describe for you some of the ways that we've been able to develop assays and, and characterize our virus-like particle membrane-containing vaccines, uh, which I think will help you to understand in general how the field is evolving with these more complex identities. So the, the next slide says identity and potency, and if we go to the slide after that, um, this is the SRID assay, the single radio immune diffusion, that I described for you briefly before. It's used for flu vaccines to really determine the amount of antigen that's present in the vaccine, and all flu vaccines have to be released by government agencies using this, this uh, assay. This assay actually is about 40 years old. Uh, it uh, consists basically of the antigen, uh, usually derived from, from flu virus grown on eggs, it, then you use that antigen to make a sheep antiserum, and when those are put together, you develop an assay that allows you to measure the amount of antigen in your vaccine preparations from different manufacturers by the size of a ring generated uh, with the antigen antibody complex that forms. Novavax has been able to develop uh, an offshoot of this assay. Uh, whereas instead of having to work with live virus, we're able to produce the HA protein in insect cells, inject that into sheep, and, and develop an assay that we can compare uh, reagents from SIBA, one of the agencies that, that does this assay, with our own assay and demonstrate that they're very comparable and can be interchanged. So uh, we're able to actually produce these reagents uh, in, in cases where a virus is hard to grow or doesn't give you very good yields of HA.
um, through this recombinant method. But again, this is a time-consuming method. takes several months to get the proper uh, hyperimmune serum in animals, and everybody is, is really interested in, in trying to find alternative ways to measure the amount of the antigen um, that would be comparable to the SRID. So if we go to the next slide, we're developing an HPLC method. What you can see here is a profile of, uh, of the RP vaccine on a reverse phase HPLC, and we've identified here the HA peak. We've uh, run here different amounts of the VLP vaccine, normalized the level of each peak at the HA position, and plotted that as a graph. And as you can see, that the concentrations there form a straight line, which allows us to very accurately measure the concentration of HA in any unknown sample against the reference sample. Some of the other peaks uh, we have also in the process of identifying. And as you can see, it's a very powerful technique for quantitating the amount of protein and determining uh, the types of proteins that are, that are in uh, a virus like particle vaccine. Next subject is purity. Um, the HPLC profile that I show, just showed you uh, is one way that we look at purity, but again, trying to identify all the proteins in an HPLC profile is, is quite challenging. So we still go back to some of the more classical techniques. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see an SDS page gel. That's Kamasi blue stain. And what we do there is we, we identify the proteins that are present either by looking at serum that recognize different proteins or by actually just cutting out a whole series of bands from the gel and performing uh, mass spec analysis of the proteins. What you can see is there is that we're able to identify not only the influenza proteins that are present in our vaccine, we're able to identify virus proteins that are present as well as SF9 host proteins that remain associated with the vaccine. So, uh, again, this is a powerful way of being able to determine the uh, characteristics of the vaccine in terms of, of, of purity. Next slide shows you that with the uh, analysis of, of a host protein, tubulin, we're able to set up uh, an ELISA assay to measure the amount of tubulin that's present in our vaccine in different preparations. And what you can see in this figure is that we tested three different preparations of a pandemic H5N1 BLP vaccine and uh, detected uh, tubulin in all three of those. We compared that to the amount in the uh, SF9 cell lysate. You can see that in, in two out of three, it was significantly uh, higher in the VLP than in the cell lysate. And surprisingly, BV, which is the vector that we're using to infect the cells to produce this vaccine, and, and is made then and therefore in the same cells, actually did not contain any of the tubulin. Um, so this is one, one example of a whole cell protein that was unique to the vaccine and not to the uh, recombinant virus that we use uh, as part of our manufacturing scheme. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about a little bit about aggregation. That's always a problem with any kind of a protein the propensity to aggregate, and, and although the virus like particle, uh, you, could, you could call it as almost like uh, uh, an aggregate, we don't want this to form even larger oligomers that uh, may cause uh, additional problems and improper immune responses. So one of the newest techniques for looking at aggregation is field flow fractionation, and uh, one can uh, separate different sized particles by this technique and detect their presence in a solution by a number of methods, online static and dynamic light scattering are uh, two of them. When we applied this technique to our BLP, we found that there was no evidence at all for aggregation. We also found that our uh, trivalent and monovalent BLPs were similar in size, and in some analysis of, of the routine square and the radius of hydration, we determined that these should be spherical particles with an open center. And if you remember the EM that I showed you a few slides ago, it's, that, that picture was very consistent with what the uh, uh, Wyatt technology determined should have been the predicted structure of a virus-like particle. But we still wanted to demonstrate that if there was aggregation, we would detect that it was technique. So we went to another technique. Next slide. Uh, particle size using Malvern Zeta Sizer. And in this technique, again, with just the VLP maintained at our normal pH of 7.2, we found for several preps that we had no evidence of aggregation. The particle size was always about 160 to 180 nanometers. However, if we dropped the pH to acid conditions around pH 4, we now definitely could detect the presence of aggregates consistent with protein unfolding causing aggregation. So it, it, it's very important that we do have a procedure that allows us to monitor the uh, formation of aggregates during the shelf life of the virus-like particle.
And the final topic that I'll briefly talk about now is comparability. So that's, that's the heading for my next slide, and the slide after that is biochemical characterization. Again, our virus-like particles really uh, are unique in that they contain a membrane, so two of the components of the membrane that we want to characterize are the fatty acids and the lipids. We want to make sure that they, they remain the same from prep to prep, uh, and are there any differences between different types of VLPs. And finally, the carbohydrate on some of the influenza proteins in the VLP is quite unique because it's coming from an insect cell, and we wanted to confirm that there were no unexpected uh, types of carbohydrate nor any linkages that uh, could be antigenic and, and potentially uh, a problem. So on the next slide, we looked at the total oligosaccharide composition of a trivalent VLP. Um, there was, this was generated through the usual uh, oligosaccharide uh, mapping techniques. And what we came up with was that there was the presence of truncated complex type, high mannose structures, very uh, like the kinds that we would expect from insect cells, which are not the fully um, sialic acid containing species that one would see from more than a million cells. So this analysis confirmed that our VLPs and the insect cells do have a slightly different carbohydrate composition than what we would see from flu virus and mammalian cells. Also, by comparing different uh, batches of our VLP, we've been able to demonstrate that this carbohydrate profile is very consistent and doesn't vary. The next slide looks at potential insect cell glycoallergens. There are two known potential glycoallergens derived in insect cells, alpha-1,3 fucose. It's uh, definitely present in plants and in some insect cell glycoproteins. The literature said that it was very low or absent in SF9 cells, the whole cell that we use to make our biocide particle vaccines. And then galactose, alpha-1,3 galactose, a known food allergen, produced at high levels in one type of insect cell, high five cells, and also reported to be very low levels in SF9 cells. So we've looked at a number of different uh, preparations of our virus by particles for both of these potential allergens, and in all cases, we've not been able to find the presence of these in multiple DLPs, uh, which, again, demonstrates that we can certainly have a product that's free of uh, these potential allergens. Next slide talks about fatty acid analysis. So now we're talking really about the properties of the membrane of the VLP and how does that occur consistently and, and between different VLPs. Surprisingly, we found that only four classes of fatty acids are present in the VLPs uh, and that there were some differences between the seasonal and, and H5N1 pandemic VLPs in their total percentages of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. And this is important because it allows us to be able to uh, continue to monitor different VLPs as we change our cell lines or a manufacturing process to make sure that we, we can really distinguish small differences in, in, in the uh, fatty acid composition during that manufacturing process. If we look at the next slide, you can get a, a, another picture of the fatty acid composition. And, and one thing that, that's apparent in this slide, as you'll see, is that there are some clear differences between the VLP and, and even the BV that we use as the vector to manufacture the VLP. So if you look at something like uh, palmitate, you'll find that the uh, that is higher in BV than it is in our VLPs. But if you look at something like oleate, you'll find that that's higher in VLPs than in BV. And basically, on the bottom of this slide, you'll see that the saturated and monosaturated ratios are quite different between virus like particles and BV, consistent with the picture that I displayed for you on the top of this graph. This slide looks at phospholipids, uh, the second component that you would find in a membrane of the VLP. And here, we're looking at cholesterol and, and zeroionic lipid composition. And again, you can see some significant differences between the uh, virus-like particles and the bacular virus and SF9 cells, which are the host. So if we look at cholesterol, we see that uh, virus-like particles in BV are higher in cholesterol than the overall SF9 lipids, suggesting that both are, uh, are really um, budding out through a very specific region of the SF9 cell membrane. Uh, however, if we look at uh, phosphatidylcholine, you can see that uh, in this case now, bacterial virus and SF9 cells are more similar, and virus-like particles has a lot, lot less phosphatidylcholine um, than, than either of the other two. So um, this again allows us to characterize and, and, and really look at the differences between BRP and, uh, and, and the phospholipids of the host of the bacterial virus, and be able to also ask the question, are there differences in phospholipids between different uh, batches and, and preparations of VLP.
So to conclude my remarks today, I just want to summarize that with new vaccines that we've developed and are continuing to develop, new analytical methods for their characterization, and, and we are really taking vaccines now more into the realm of biological and monoclonal antibodies and being able to really understand more about what are different contaminants that are present in the vaccines, what are important attributes for potency, and, and what are important attributes for stability. And uh, I think that uh, these results really do indicate that it is possible to characterize these more complex vaccines, including virus-like particles, very much in, in the ways that one uh, wants to go about for designation as well-characterized biologicals, so that, again, the uh, manufacturing will not be the great limiting step in the release of these vaccines, but they will be released basically on our knowledge of their physical and biochemical properties. And with that, I want to thank you and uh, wish you uh, a chance to uh, answer any questions that you have. Back to you. Thanks, Stephen. If you have any questions for Stephen, please submit them now by typing your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hitting Submit. Um, our second and final speaker is Chris Fox, Lead Formulation Engineer for the Infectious Disease Research Institute in Seattle. He's involved with developing and characterizing vaccine adjuvant compounds using synthetic TLR agonists and adjuvant formulations, including suspensions, liposomes, and emulsions for better manufacturability, stability, and biological activity. Chris will provide an in-depth overview of adjuvant formulations. Chris, we're ready when you are. Thanks, Tamlin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Pincus for that very informative talk on VLPs. I'd also like to thank Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News and Dianex for the opportunity to present today. I'm going to share a few thoughts about vaccine adjuvant formulations and methods to characterize them with particular emphasis on charged aerosol detection. So moving on to the next slide. Just a little bit about me and the Infectious Disease Research Institute where I work. I'm a formulation engineer at IDRI, as we call it, in Seattle. This is a nonprofit biotech whose mission is to develop vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics for neglected diseases. We have several unique capabilities, one of which is a large effort on vaccine adjuvant development, which I'll be discussing more about today. Um, funding from several organizations makes our work possible, which you see listed there. Next slide. So in this slide, I just want to give you an idea of what we'll be discussing in the next 20 minutes. I'd like to give an overview of the vaccine adjuvant field by first describing what adjuvants are and why they're needed. And then we'll talk about the history of adjuvant development and what the present challenges and opportunities are with adjuvants. One of those challenges is appropriate physical chemical characterization. And so I'll show some data collected using HPLC with charge aerosol detection, as well as some other complementary analytical methods. So on the next slide, um, I want to talk about what adjuvants are and why they're needed. So adjuvants are simply substances added to vaccines to modulate or boost the immune response. They can do that through increasing humoral and cellular immune responses, and there are numerous advantages that go along with that, including facilitating vaccine antigen dose reduction or the required number of doses. And so this becomes a huge benefit in the event of something like a pandemic influenza where there isn't enough antigen to go around. So, for instance, let's take a look at this figure comparing immune responses in people receiving a pandemic influenza antigen alone at various doses versus people receiving the same antigen with an adjuvant called ASO3. And the adjuvanted responses are represented by the green bars. So you can see that the hemagglutinin inhibition titers are much higher in the group with adjuvant, especially at day 42 after a, a booster dose. So the 3.75 micrograms of antigen with adjuvant is better than 90 micrograms of antigen without adjuvant. So in this scenario, you've boosted your antigen supply by at least 24-fold by using an adjuvant. Another benefit of adjuvants is that they can enable vaccine efficacy in the elderly, infants, or otherwise immunocompromised individuals. And besides shaping or boosting the immune response, adjuvants can broaden the immune response 
so that the vaccine is protective even against antigens of heterologous pathogen strains. Much of modern vaccine antigen development is focused on highly purified recombinant proteins, which is a great thing because they're safe and rationally designed, but at the same time, these subunit vaccines are also much less potent, and therefore they need the help that adjuvants can provide. So in my next slide, I want to break down in, in general categories what the different classes of adjuvants are. In reality, there's a lot of crossover between these classes, but, but this gives us some general idea of, of the different options out there. The first type of adjuvant includes molecules that directly stimulate immune cells. These so-called immunostimulatory molecules often have specific receptors, such as TLR, toll-like receptors, that upon binding induce immune signaling cascades. For example, the small molecule you see on the right there is called R848 and is an agonist of TLR78 located endosomally in humans. Another class of adjuvants include delivery systems, such as various nanoparticle platforms like liposomes or emulsions. These adjuvants are not necessarily immunostimulatory of themselves, but instead they present the antigen more effectively to the immune system, thus enabling increased biological activity. Okay, so in, in reality, many adjuvants are actually combinations of the above two classes with particulate vehicles that facilitate presentation of both antigens and immunostimulatory molecules to the immune system. And so you may have heard of, of some of the combination type formulations that are out there, such as ASO4, which was recently approved in the U.S. as part of the human papillomavirus vaccine called Cervarix, manufactured by GSK. Moving on to the next slide, let's discuss a little bit about the mechanisms of action of adjuvants. There are many known specific mechanisms of action of adjuvants and many more that have yet to be characterized. But the things we do know are that adjuvants can promote uptake of antigens by antigen-presenting cells, or APCs, as they're called. They can also stimulate these APCs through their TLRs and other receptors to induce cytokine and other co-stimulatory molecule production, which eventually leads to the migration of the APCs to lymph nodes where they can activate T and B cells. Now, all of this can be modulated in various ways by adjuvants, leading to different types of immune responses, such as a Th1 or a Th2 bias. So, in the next slide, let's talk about the history of vaccine adjuvant development. So this is quite an interesting story. In, in the early experiments involving adjuvants, um, there was a very empirical type approach. So as you can see in the substances listed there, there was, there was a, a number of, of these substances that were analyzed for their ability to boost antibody responses. So we're talking about tapioca, tree bark extracts, even breadcrumbs. A couple of years later, um, metallic salts, especially aluminum salts, or alum as they're known, were found to be effective boosters of antibody responses. And so these were found also to be safe and um, were used in early vaccines such as the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine. Also, at this time, there was a lot of interest in water and mineral oil emulsions such as incomplete Freund's adjuvant, or IFA. And this particular adjuvant was actually used in thousands of people with influenza and polio vaccines in the mid-20th century, but was eventually discontinued due to local reactogenicity, the site of injection. More recently, efforts have emphasized pathogen-associated molecular patterns or immunostimulatory derivatives or analogs of pathogens, such as lipopolysaccharide derivatives, or double-stranded RNA. In addition, new nanoparticle-based formulations such as liposomes have proven useful. Now, in the next slide, in the last 20 years, the huge increase in understanding immunologies has allowed us to comprehend some of these mechanisms of action of adjuvants and to develop more effective and safe adjuvants. At the same time, the use of highly pure subunit or recombinant antigens has only increased the need for adjuvants in order to elicit effective immune responses. So what that's translated into is, is huge interest in adjuvant development 
And out of all this has come some very effective adjuvant molecules and delivery systems. Um, for instance, MPL, a natural LPS derivative, and TLR4 agonist. Aminazoquinolins and bacterial oligonucleotide mimics called CPG are also effective adjuvants, um, these in particular of endosomal TLR agonists. And oil and water emulsions, um, now using metabolizable oil instead of the earlier mineral oil formulations, have been shown to be very effective and safe adjuvants. So in the next slide, let's review the current status of, of adjuvants today. For many years, alum was the only approved adjuvant in the U.S., but in 2009, the MPL alum adjuvant called ASO4 was approved, as we mentioned earlier. And the U.S. is also stockpiling oil and water emulsion adjuvants in the event of pandemic influenza, but they are not currently used in U.S. vaccines. Now, in Europe, these emulsions have already been approved and are used in various vaccines as well as some other adjuvant platforms. Many more adjuvants are in development, including some in late-stage clinical trials. For instance, ASO1 is an adjuvant formulation, again from GSK. It contains liposomes, MPL, and QS21, a saponin molecule. And this is currently being evaluated in a phase three clinical trial in a malaria vaccine. Moving on to the next slide, I want to show you here the range of structures. You can see that the range is quite large. We get all kinds of different structures. Um, there are the lipid-based TLR4 agonists, such as MPL or GLA, which I'm showing here, a synthetic analog that we work, uh, work with here at IDRI. There's the saponin, um, QS21. There are the small molecule and quinolins, such as R848 and amiquimod. Amiquimod, in particular, is, is approved as part of a topical cream formulation called Aldera. There are the double-stranded RNA analogs, such as polyIC or the bacterial oligonucleotides called CPGs. Now, this range of structures necessitates different tools and approaches, both to formulation and, of course, to analytical characterization. Okay, so those are the immunostimulatory molecules. How about the range of formulations or delivery systems? So in, in this slide, uh, we've, we've talked about alum, which consists of crystalline particulate aggregates on the order of a few microns in size. Um, alum is most effective when used to absorb either antigens or immunostimulatory molecules to its highly charged surface. Now, the oil and water emulsions used today are generally around 100 nanometers in size and consist of metabolizable components. There are also a variety of vesicular formulations, namely liposomes, virosomes, and neosomes with lipids or surfactants self-assembling into bilayer structures that can be used to formulate antigens or other adjuvants, either within the aqueous core or intercalated in the lipid bilayer. These different formulations can be manufactured through various mechanisms. Ideally, a high-energy process is used in order to create uniform and small particle size that can be sterile filtered. So in the next slide, let's talk about the main considerations um, that need to be taken into account at each stage of, of adjuvant development. So we need to look at raw material purity and source, formulation stability and manufacturability, and, of course, throughout all of this, there is the huge need for appropriate analytical techniques. The goal is to thoroughly characterize each step of the manufacturing process and the stability of the resulting product. In the next slide, I'm just giving some examples of, of some of the basic techniques that we use here at IDRI. Of course, the analytical techniques that are required depend on the adjuvant formulation and its properties. For instance, some of the basic techniques that would be used to characterize an oil and water emulsion would be zeta potential, which is related to particle charge, measured by microelectrophoresis, particle size, and here I'm showing a, a data from dynamic light scattering measurements, visual appearance, and component quantitation by HPLC with charged aerosol detection. In this trace here in the lower left of the slide, we can see contributions from the oil, the emulsifiers, and an additional immunostimulatory molecule. 
So it's about this HPLC CAD technique in particular that I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing in the next slides. So in the next slide, let's talk about what is charged aerosol detection or CAD. So it's a mass sensitive detector for non-volatile and semi-volatile compounds. The detection process includes nebulization of the HPLC column effluent through nitrogen gas, whose inlet is shown there on the right in the figure. And this is followed by evaporation of the mobile phase solvent through a drying tube. Now, a secondary stream of nitrogen gas is charged by passing a high voltage corona needle. The generated ions then collide with the analyte particles in the mixing chamber, where the now charged particles pass through to the collector or charges measured by an electrometer. One of the key advantages for us is that the CAD detection mechanism does not require chromophores for molecules to be detected. So in the next slide, I'd like to begin showing some data we've collected in our lab, some of the applications we found for the CAD detection mechanism. So we've been using it in our research lab to quantitate the concentration of an amino stimulatory molecule that I um, introduced earlier called GLA a TLR4 agonist whose structure is, is once again shown here on the right. This is a non-chromophore, non-volatile molecule, and so CAD becomes a very useful technique. Here I'm showing the peak generated over a wide range of concentrations of the adjuvant, and in the inset, you can see the calibration curve. Now, the CAD response is nonlinear, so I'm, I'm using a nonlinear fit, but the deviation is, is low over three consecutive runs, as you can see. We're now working on optimizing the sensitivity of this method and transferring it to our quality control lab. So in the next slide, you can see that besides quantitation of active ingredient concentration, we've also found the CAD to be useful in raw material purity assessment. So here I'm showing one of our emulsion components, the metabolizable oil squalene. The squalene is available in high purity from shark liver and the HPLC CAD trace is shown in black of the shark derived squalene in this figure. However, for regulatory and sustainability considerations, there's interest in obtaining squalene from non-animal sources, one of which is olives. So we're showing in red and blue the HPLC CAD traces from two different vendors of the olive derived squalene. As you can see, the the HPLC CAD reveals several impurities in the olive-derived material compared to the shark-derived material. And we, we publish this in, in Colloids and Surfaces B, references there on the bottom. So what this translated into for us in the next slide, you can see that there was less stability in the formulations employing olive-derived squalene. So here I'm showing representative particle size data over three months for stable and less stable emulsion formulations as determined by particle size growth. So you can see here that the olive squalene emulsions showed some instability compared to the shark squalene emulsions, which were all stable. So this particle size data from dynamic light scattering seemed to corroborate the detection of destabilizing impurities in the olive derived squalene detected by HPLC CAT. In the next slide, my last example, I want to show you HPLC CAD traces of complete adjuvant formulations. So due to the wide variety of molecules that can be detected with the CAD, we found it to be effective not only for single component analysis, but for global formulation analysis. So what I mean is in a single run, we can get information about multiple formulation components. For example, here on top is an oil and water emulsion that consists of emulsifiers, oil, and GLA, the immunostimulatory molecule. Here on the bottom, we see a liposomal formulation with two different phospholipids, cholesterol, and once again, the adjuvant molecule, GLA. So with a single method, we can feasibly get information about the stability of, of all of these components over time as we monitor these formulations. So summarizing in the next slide, I hope through this talk today you've been able to see the importance of adjuvants as critical components in modern vaccines and the wide range of molecules and formulation platforms that are in development or use as adjuvants.
I think the history of adjuvant development has given us some of the products we use today, but the empirical approach used in the last century needs to be replaced by rational design based on immunology, formulation know-how, and importantly, analytical characterization. HPLC CAD is one analytical tool that allows effective characterization of raw material purity, active ingredient concentration, and simultaneous excipient stability analysis. It has become for us an important tool in our analytical instrumentation suite. By way of acknowledgments in the next slide, my thanks go out to my colleagues here at IDRI who have been responsible for developing the adjuvant program, acquiring and maintaining the necessary analytical tools, manufacturing the formulations, and collecting the analytical characterization data that we've seen today. Also, thanks to other important collaborators, such as Dr. Martin Frieda at the WHO, and of course, to the Gates Foundation, who has funded much of the adjuvant work discussed in these slides. So that does it for me. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I'll send it back to you, Tamlin. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, before we begin the Q&A session, I want to issue a final call for your questions. Uh, please type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and hit Enter. We have a bunch of questions. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. Stephen, our first question is for you. It's a multi-part question, so here we go. What about proteomic analysis of vaccines? Would this approach be more appropriate with greater sensitivity than a Western blot or immunofluorescence for characterization? Should we be thinking about utilizing modern tools to characterize the identity of vaccines? I think this is a very uh, interesting uh, set of questions, and, and, and I think that it's very important that we be able to identify all of the proteins that are present in, in a complex vaccine like a virus-like particle. And so we have been taking the approach of using mass spec uh, and as well as various separation techniques to be able to uh, isolate and identify uh, the various proteins. Uh, that said, it's, I think it's also important uh, to, to utilize some of the classical techniques and real, you know, like Western blot. Uh, and, and, and other methods to, to really see how, how new tools add to our understanding of vaccines in terms of their potency and, and safety um, so that we, as, as we go forward in the future, we, we're able to, to make use of the best uh, assays, whether they be newer tools or, or some existing technologies um, to address these concerns. Okay. The next question is, uh, what types of routes of administration are possible with VLPs, and how does each influence the bias, the TH1 and the TH2, of the subsequent immune response? Okay, so we've, we've uh, tested several different routes with our uh, virus-like particle uh, VLPs. We've certainly given them IM, and we've also given them intranasal, and uh, we find that they're uh, efficiently uh, able to induce uh, broad immune responses by, by both types of routes. So what we see is, is not only uh, antibody responses, but we also see cellular responses when we give these antigens by both routes. So, and, 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 and part of that is because the virus-like particle itself, uh, with it, its membrane characteristics actually serves as a self-adjuranted uh, vaccine. So it's able to elicit very broad immune responses um, by, by multiple routes that really uh, don't necessarily, although they can be boosted by the presence of uh, additional exogenous adjuvant. Um, Steve, what is HA and NA? So HA and NA are two of the major influenza proteins. HA is hemagglutinin, which is the basis for all flu vaccines. It's what uh, all, all vaccines are, are, are tested for for potency, uh, and it's antibody to HA that's considered to give us protection against influenza. Uh, NA is the neuromidase protein of influenza virus. Uh, our virus-like particles are unique in that we're able to uh, not only uh, have NA present in them, we're able to control the amount of NA and, and measure it and determine that it's functional. And we've been able to show that we get uh, very good immune responses to both the HA and NA with our vaccine and that the NA responses do contribute to uh, functional uh, inhibition of uh, flu virus. Okay, here's another one. Any plan to have intact BLP quantitative analysis by HPLC, um, SEC, or reverse phase? Yeah, so we are utilizing a number of different HPLC techniques to further characterize the VLP. 
Um, the problem is VLPs are, are fairly large, uh, so it's, it's difficult to find uh, HPLC conditions where you can get good separation of, of different uh, size states of the VLP. We've done some uh, sedimentation analysis with VLP. We've been able to show that there's actually several different size particles present there. Um, but we do use HPLC both reverse phase and size exclusion um, to help us identify the various protein components of the VLP. As I, as I showed you in one of my slides, uh, we've developed a very good assay that allows us to quantitate the amount of HA and, and in the VLP using HPLC. And we're trying to develop that method further to look at the, the contribution of, of NA and M1 and then also to identify and, and, and determine the quantities of, of both cellular, SF9, and BB proteins that, that are present in different VLP preparations. Hey, Stephen, we're being bombarded with questions for you, so I have some more. Um, how does the phospholipid composition compare to native virus envelopes? We've, we've looked at that, and so basically... Uh, there is there is quite a difference between the, uh, the insect cell virus-like particles and, and native influenza virus. So if you actually do NMR looking at, at the effect of temperature on membrane fluidity, what you'll find is that the uh, VLP is much more stable than influenza virus. Influenza virus will, will show a change in membrane uh, fluidity uh, at a much uh, lower temperature than, than, than required for VLP. And, and we think that this is uh, an, another characteristic of, of VLP, which allows allows us to maintain uh, good stability and, and, and especially good NA activity in, in, in the VLP uh, better than what we see when we look at uh, live flu virus. All right, uh, Steve, another question for you. There are a number of publications regarding VLPs using alum as an adjuvant. Do you feel you need the additional adjuvant with VLP vaccines? As I stated earlier, VLPs are, are self-adjuvanted, so uh, we find that if we compare VLP to uh, subunit protein, uh, we do find the, that the VLP is more immunogenic than the corresponding uh, single proteins. That said, we have uh, some evidence that we can use certain adjuvants with, with VLP, including alum, uh, including uh, a number of other adjuvants um, that, that, that Chris Fox talked about. Uh, and, and so uh, it is possible to, to enhance the immune response to the VLP uh, by using certain adjuvants, and, and we are continuing to look at that, uh, again, as, as a way of, of furthering the, the immunogenicity of the vaccine. Thanks, Stephen. This is the last question for you for now. We might come back to you later. Um, you mentioned that your VLP preps contain, contained more than flu proteins. What percent of total protein in the VLP was HA, NA, and M1? Okay, that's that's variable from one construct to another. Uh, we can, we have some VLP constructs where the HA, NA, and M1 represent about 95% of the total protein uh, on down to other constructs where it only represents about 80% of the total protein. And one of the things that, that we've been looking at as we've shifted from an initial wave platform technology to produce material to stir tanks, is, is, is just where, where are these proteins? Are, are they part of the contamination of the VLP, or are any of them embedded in the VLP? And we find that, in particular, the baculovirus GP64 protein is uh, embedded in the membrane of the VLP, and uh, therefore uh, that does contribute to having uh, less purity than, than one might uh, expect uh, based on... On, on, on the purification schemes that we're following. All right, Chris, we're going to you now. Uh, which vaccine adjuvant products in advanced development are the most promising? So I would have to say the adjuvant field has, has got their eyes on ASO1 right now, which is an adjuvant manufactured by GSK. It contains MPL, QS21, in a liposomal um, formulation, and it's in phase three clinical trials for malaria vaccine. Um, I think further down the line, exciting approaches that include intradermal injection through, through microneedles and also um, synergistic formulations that contain, you know, uh, more than one synthetic TLR agonist. Okay, Chris, um, are there any other benefits of reducing antigen dose other than supply limitations? So that's a great question. Um, first of all, I'd like to differentiate between reducing antigen dose and dosage, in other words, the number of injections that are required. So even if you don't reduce the antigen dose, if you can reduce the number of injections required, you can imagine how much easier it would be to administer and to get um, increased coverage, especially in developing countries. 
All right, Chris, which adjuvants are known to be associated with tumor induction, and can this be predicted, uh, adjuvant design, I guess? So I, I think a lot of this stems from the, the early days in adjuvant development when very heterogeneous components were used, non-metabolizable components such as mineral oil. You know, these were, were very dirty, um, and, and they were injected in, in maybe excessive amounts. And so um, that's when you see this kind of reactogenicity. I think modern vaccine adjuvant development um, is based on very safe and synthetic components. And we need to remember that the live attenuated vaccines that have been used for, for years safely um, contain inherent adjuvants just, just based on their, on, on their makeup. And these have been used in, in infants. And, and so um, adjuvants, if, if they're done um, in a highly purified manner and in the right amounts, are, are very safe. Okay, Chris, uh, now I have a multi-part question for you. Um, is the surface chemistry of adjuvant critical, or is it the size, or both? And what about the interaction between adjuvant and the antigen? So those are great questions, um, and the answer is, is yes to all of those. All of those are very critical components. The charge, um, the size of, of the formulation, these, these all have um, very important functions, and um, of course, it all depends on um, the antigen as well and the antigen structure, whether it's a VLP like Steve talked about or a recombinant protein. Um, the way that interacts with the adjuvant formulation will depend on, on all of these factors and, and the ensuing immune response. So this, this needs to be taken into account with each new vaccine combination. Okay, Chris, uh, what is the effect of these immunostimulant TLR agonists in my D88 knockout mice? So that's, that's another a great question um, concerning mechanisms of action. And um, that is very dependent on the structure of the agonist. And some of them go um, through different pathways. So some are going to be Mighty 88 biased or TRIS biased or other pathways. And that's, that's highly dependent on, on their structure. And so that, that needs to be investigated um, with each new adjuvant. All right, Chris, um, last question for you. Um, besides charged aerosol detection, what other analytical techniques have you found to be essential to vaccine adjuvant development and quality control? So I, I mentioned in one slide um, particle size. Steve also mentioned the importance of, of particle size measurements for VLPs. Um, particle charge is indicated by zeta potential measurements. Um, these, are, these are fundamental measurements that, that should be done. Also, looking on a deeper level, um, I think it's, it's very important and exciting to um, use different spectroscopies such as FTIR, um, fluorescent, UV vis, and calorimetric methods such as DSC and ITC. These are heavily used in, in drug development, um, and, and just now I think they're, they're starting to bleed over into the vaccine field and they're telling us things that we just didn't understand before and helping us to, to rationally design better vaccines. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, Stephen, for answering all those questions as well. Unfortunately, our time is up. Um, thanks for listening in, and uh, thank you for submitting all the great questions. Uh, this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to friends and colleagues. Once again, I want to thank Stephen and Chris, as well as our sponsor, Dionix, a global leader in the manufacture and marketing of chromatography and extraction systems, consumables, and software for chemical analysis. This webinar is part of an ongoing series to provide solutions to pressing application challenges. We'll be sending you a survey shortly and hope you'll take the time to respond. Your comments help us continue to provide topical and timely webinars. Thank you very much.